this is, uh, I'm going to call it his restricted notion of supervision. Okay, as it said, any world <clears throat> which is a minimal physical duplicate of our world is a duplicate simpliciter, that is a complete duplicate of our world. And what he means by minimal physical duplicate is what you get if you, as he puts it, duplicate our world in all physical respects and stop right there. Where all physical respects means roughly, he gives a few ways of understanding this, but roughly um, the entities, properties, and relations and laws posited by the physical sciences, or what I'm going to refer to as the narrowly physical. And that's a sort of important term to keep in mind in my analysis of his um, argument that physicalism employs, implies supervenience. Um, so, right, so the, a, a supervenience thesis is, starts with some restricted, pared down notion of physical properties, and says that, um, if physicalism is true, then um, everything else sort of is determined by this pared down notion of physical properties. There's also, yeah, so that's what I call the narrowly physical. Okay, so there's also another notion of the physical, the broadly physical, which is the idea that um, if, when you say that physicalism is a thesis that everything is physical, then you mean that, you know, so that tables and chairs can be physical as well. Okay, so it's just a, so to sort of keep the terminology clear, it might be. Help keep that in mind. Okay, so, okay, in other words, um, what his uh, restricted supervenience thesis says is that any world that duplicates the narrowly physical entities, properties, relations, and laws of our world, and nothing extra save for what follows from necessity, um, follows by necessity from those, duplicates everything in our world. Okay, um, so although there's a lively debate in the literature about whether some form of physicalism, if some form of supervenience is sufficient for physicalism. Many seem to find the claim, as I was saying before, that physicalism implies RS obvious, perhaps even definitional. And of course, if it were definitional, we'd have a good explanation for this rather rare occurrence of widespread agreement in philosophy. However, I'm going to argue that it doesn't follow by definition, and it doesn't necessarily follow at all, that it doesn't even doesn't follow at all. Okay. Okay, so you don't find, of course, if it's thought to be definitional, you're not going to find many arguments that physicalism implies a supervenience <coughs> thesis, but there are a few. Um, very small number as far as I can tell, and Frank Jensen seems to be the most worked out argument. And here it is. I'll read it through and then we'll go through it again, like step by step. So, um, so this is what it says. Suppose to start with that restricted supervenience is false. Then our world and some minimal physical duplicate of it differ. At least one contains something the other does not. But by definition, a minimal physical duplicate of our world does not contain any laws in particular or instantiate any properties or relations that do not appear in our world. Everything in a minimal physical duplicate of our world is in our world. Does our world contain some laws or particulars or instantiate some properties or relations that the minimal physical duplicate does not? Um, well, but if it did, but then these particulars or properties and relations would have to be non-physical, as our world and the duplicate are physically identical, and physicalism would be false. Hence, if RS is false, then physicalism is false. That is, physicalism is committed to RS. Okay, let's um, go through this step by step. I think it's pretty straightforward, but here it is. Okay, so first we su suppose that restricted supervenience is false. Um, if it's false, then um, our world and some minimal physical duplicate of it differ. At least one contains something the other does not. But by definition, every entity or law in a minimal physical duplicate of our world is in our world, and every property or relation instantiated in a minimal physical duplicate of our world is instantiated in our world. Um, Moreover, if our world were to contain or instantiate anything that the minimal physical duplicate does not, then whatever it is wouldn't be physical, and physicalism would be false. Thus, this conclusion, physicalism implies RS. Okay, I think that premise two and three are pretty obvious, uh, but I think that four requires some argument. Okay. Um, premise four tells us that 
if our world were contains something that a minimal physical duplicate would not, then whatever it is wouldn't be physical. Where the relevant notion of physical is not the narrow sense of physical, and just the properties and entities and laws of physical science, physics, um, since the existence of a blade of grass, for example, is not going to refute physicalism, but rather it's supposed to be the broad sense of physical, which encompasses the narrowly physical as well as grass, tables, chairs, and assuming that physicalism is true, everything else. Okay, so, but why should, okay, so that's what the premise says, but why should we accept this? Why should we accept that um, any, um, that any minimal physical duplicate, um, if there was something that our, that um, wasn't, that it didn't have, that our world did have, why would that um, refute physical? Okay, so why must our world contain something broadly non-physical if it were to contain something that a minimal physical duplicate would not? Okay. If we assume that physicalism, of course, implies supervenience, then these R-worldly supernumeraries would count as non-physical. But we cannot make this assumption in the context of an argument intended to, improve, to prove the implication. Of course, right, of course, if he's assuming um, that um, physicalism implies some sort of supervenience thesis, then, uh, then these these extra things in our world that are duplicated would be non-physical, but we can't assume that. Um, so the only reason Jackson does hint at something, he says the only reason um, Jackson provides is that our world and the duplicate are physically identical. Well, but how do we know that? Certainly, we know that our world and the minimal physical duplicate are narrowly, because that's what the recipe says for making supervenience. It says that you duplicate all the narrowly physical properties. Okay, so we know that they're identical in that way. Um, but how do we know that they are broadly physically identical? That means, how do we know that, um, you know, there's nothing in them that would refute physicalism. So not only in the microphysically identical, but um, the Ta there's tables and chairs and all that, physically identical in that sense. Um, how do we know, in other words, that anything in our world that does not appear in the minimal physical duplicate cannot be physical in the broad sense of physical? The broad sense of physical. Okay. Well, Jackson hasn't provided an argument for this yet. We need to know this in order to conclude that the difference between um, worlds is due to our world containing something broadly non-physical, which in turn is needed to show that physicalism would be false in such a situation. Okay, right. So um, I don't think his his argument that physicalism implies a supervenience thesis works. I mean, basically, he's not really in his. I think you know this is my analysis really keeping clear the difference between a, a narrow conception of physical and a broad conception. Um, Okay, he has, also has a few, I think, more throwaway remarks that, uh, for why he thinks um, physicalism plus supervenience, but since there's so few arguments for this, we'll look at those as well. Okay, so he also argues that supervenience includes, it, it excludes independent variation between narrowly physical and mental properties, and such independent variation would imply that mentality is over and above the physical. And okay, so, yeah, as he explains, position in space-time is over and above what can be specified by three coordinates. Um, uh, let's see, but I'm feeling now that like this should be over here. So sorry, I just got to, I'm going to move this here. No, but then I'm going to then that too. Okay, sorry. It was uncomfortable. Okay. So, he, so he explains that position in space-time is over and above what can be specified by three coordinates, since all the four coordinates completely determined position in space-time and objects position in space-time can vary. Well, three of its coordinates remain constant. Okay, of course, right? Similarly, average density is over and above mass, since although mass and volume determine average density and objects average density can vary, while its mass remains constant. Okay, true enough. But um, must, why must physicalism exclude independent variation? And why? Um, 
Jackson's arguments are arguments of identity, so of course they exclude such variation, but physicalism need not imply mind brain identity. Or at least most people think it doesn't, so it, you know, so it doesn't follow that it has to exclude independent variation. Um, okay, Gene Whitmere also has a brief argument that I think he takes to show that physicalism must imply some sort of supervenience thesis. Um, and he tells us that if mental properties are nothing over and above narrowly physical properties, as is claimed by physicalism, right? That's sometimes how you hear the thesis stated. The mental is nothing over and above the physical. Um, then, narrowly physical properties suffice for mental properties as is asserted by supervenience, that's sort of the general idea. Okay, the argument, the general argument for this, he says, is short and sweet. Okay, suppose Q didn't suffice for P, that is, suppose it is possible for it to be true that Q, while not true that P, that's something in addition to the fact that Q is needed to make it true that, then something in addition to the fact that Q is needed to make it true that P, in which case, surely, the fact that P is something over and above the fact that Q. Okay, good enough. Um, the argument is short, but I question its sweetness. To be sure, if P does not supervene on Q, then P will be in some sense over and above whatever that really means. But it seems like, okay, that's enough to make it over and above Q. But Whitmere doesn't argue, and he didn't really like, intend to argue, but he hasn't argued that physicalism must imply that mental properties cannot be over and above in some way the properties of physics. Okay, this is where the frowns can start to come in, right? Um, certainly physicalism must imply that all properties are physical in the broad sense, but and in some sense or other, we haven't yet really figured out what sense that is, right? Part of this you know, questioning whether it has to be a supervenience relation there. But we do not yet have a reason for thinking that in order for mental properties to be physical, in the broad sense, they must supervene on narrowly physical properties. We just, I mean, that shouldn't be a frown, right? I just say, all I'm saying really is there's no argument yet. There's no argument. Oh, well, it's just definitional, there shouldn't be argument. Well, I think, um, I think there should be a reason, at least, for why we're thinking this. Okay, so, well, okay. Um, not explicit, but I think perhaps the most common reason for thinking that physicalism requires a supervenience principle, such as RS, is that physicalism is thought to entail this idea that God, as it were, after creating the domain of fundamental physics, rested. And the failure of RS means that there was more work to be done. Okay. Um, but why must physicalism imply this? Why? Okay, it's a sort of general idea that it does, but why should it? Um, I think, just from my analysis of the history, a little analysis of the history of how this concept came up, is um, the idea of physicalism entailing that God had only to set the quantum gamble in motion has, I think, has its roots in Saul Kripke's figurative description of the relation between pain and C fiber stimulation. On Kripke's account, in order for us to feel C fiber stimulation as pain, God had to perform some extra task beyond merely creating C-fiber stimulation, which shows, Kripke argues, that the identity theory is false. Okay, so, believers in the entailment from physicalism to supervenience take this one step further, however, and assume that if God had more work to do, or in other words, if supervenience fails, then not just the identity theory is false, but physicalism is false. Um, Yet, if we accept that physicalism need not be an identity thesis, why should the failure of supervenience have this implication? Um, physicalists who accept the all God had to do metaphor do not think right, that God actually <coughs> enters the picture. Rather, God is understood as a placeholder for certain unknown forces of nature. So. As long as God doesn't really exist, what's wrong with having her do a little extra work? This extra work may appear suspect because it seems to involve further acts of creation, as it were beyond the initial creation of that extremely hot, swarming soup that emanated from the Big Bang. But if physicalists can accept that nature can take care of the initial creation, 
it seems that they should be able to accept that nature could take care of this as well. Why does this extra work, this metaphorical extra work, have to imply that physicalism is false? I mean, the first work doesn't imply that it does, so why should, the, why should more work imply that? To be sure, if RS or some other similarly weak supervenience principle does not hold in our world, then additional laws are needed to account well, many would think, at least, that additional laws would then be needed to account for observed regularities between lower level and higher level properties. For example, like we might need an extra law that guarantees that every time that, say, a certain quantum configuration occurs, a certain event at the chemical level occurs, okay, if, we, if there's this failure of supervenience. Um, and isn't this some people might say, exactly the type of law that would hold between the neural and the mental if dualism is true. Well, perhaps it is, but why should that matter? The law of gravity, for example, would presumably also hold if dualism were true, yet the law of gravity does not pose a problem for physicalism. Um, no doubt there's Occam's razor to consider, and a world with additional laws connecting higher and lower level properties might seem ontologically profligate. However, this razor is merely a methodological tool, and in terms of leading us to the true nature of the world, it's always been thought of as the disposable variety. In other words, when devising a theory, it might be preferable to pick the simpler of two empirically equivalent hypotheses, but the world itself might not conform to the simpler hypothesis. The world, even if physicalism is true, might not be clean-shaven. Okay, so, okay, so that's the, you know, so in sum, I don't think there are really any strong arguments for the view that physicalism implies a supervenious thesis. Um, okay, well, but this, of course, is not an argument against the view that it does because, um, especially given that there are many who don't think it, this entailment even needs an argument. So, what I should present now is my knockdown refutation um, of this implication, but I, I don't have that, so here's an argument of a rather gentler persuasion. <laughs> okay. Um, so, here's a little thought experiment. Okay. Imagine that our world were such that duplicating our fundamental physics, that is, duplicating the world's quantum state or whatever it is that's actually fundamental, would fail to duplicate anything, any higher level entities or properties whatsoever. So, we duplicate some, we take it, if, we were, if our world were such, our world might not be like that, probably it's not right, but imagine that our world were like that. That is, imagine that duplicating fundamental physics could give us a world with, say, just quarks, leptons, and their, their antiparticles and such like, but no chemical bonds, no molecules, no cells, no organisms. So, if our world were like this, higher level properties would fail to supervene on fundamental physical ones. Um, but must this imagined world be a world in which physicalism is false? Um, or to narrow the question down, must we take uh, chemical bonds in this world to be non-physical? Okay, so would the chemical bonds in this world that we're imagining, where, where the quantum level doesn't um, suffice for chem chemical bonding, um, would chemical bonds be non-physical? It seems to me that there's no reason to think that they would be. In such a situation, chemical bonding would not supervene on the fundamental physical properties, but why should this alone matter as to whether chemical bonding is physical? It seems that it shouldn't. Yet, if it doesn't, then the failure of any other higher level property, including mental properties, to supervene on physics should, it seems, similarly not suffice to make those higher level properties non-physical. Where, you know, so um, in the thought experiment, the mental also doesn't supervene on the physics because it's, um, nothing was being duplicated. Okay, so 
In other words, if the non-supervenience of chemical bonding on physics is consistent with physicalism, then the non-supervenience of the mental on physics should be consistent with physicalism as well. Um, okay, well, one question he might ask is, is it even possible to imagine that chemistry fails to supervene on physics? Well, and there are certain philosophers, certain physicalists, or an anti-physicalist too, who um, hold that there's an a priori relation between um, the level of the narrowly physical and higher level physical properties. But a priori physicalists hold that if physicalism is true, then the fundamental physical properties of our world a priori necessitate the higher level properties of our world. Thus, for the a priori physicalist, if physicalism is true, it's not possible to imagine coherently that a world that duplicates our physics fails to duplicate everything else about our world. Okay. But even the a priori physicalists think that physicalism is a contingent doctrine in as much as it could have been false. For example, they allow for the possibility of Cartesian dualism, which involves a physics that is substantially different from ours, a physics which is such that duplicating it would not duplicate the mental realm. Okay, so even the a priori physicalists allow that that's a possibility. So it seems they would also allow for the possibility of a physics different from our own that could, dupl that could be duplicated without duplicating anything else. Okay, just a possibility. Um, David Lewis has identified a weak supervenience principle along the lines of RS. It's similar, you know, details are different, but similar to Jacqueline's. As a minimal physicalist commitment, a principle shared by all versions of physicalism. But the failure of chemistry to supervene on physics is actually compatible, I think, with various apparently physicalistic views. For example, we could still maintain a mind-brain identity thesis, one that holds that mental properties just are certain neural properties, since even if duplicating physics would fail to duplicate the chemical and everything above it, it still could be that, say, experiencing intense painful heat is nothing more than activity in the anterior cingulate cortex or whatever it is that on the identity theory is thought to be identical to such an experience. <laughs> Um, okay, so the failure to, of chemistry to supervene on physics is also consistent with eliminativism, since it is compatible with there being no mental properties in our world at all. Yet, a world bereft of mentality, it seems, could be a world in which physicalism is true, regardless of whether chemistry supervenes on physics. Um, of course, <coughs> Even if chemistry fails to supervene on physics, the mental could still supervene on the neural and ultimately on the chemical in the sense that any world that minimally duplicates the chemical might also duplicate the mental. Thus, one might think that all my thought experiment shows is that if our world were like this, then the supervenient space should be expanded to include the chemical, or as Jackson suggests, all the physical sciences. So maybe you want your supervenience space to be more broad than just the entities, properties, laws, and relations of physics. But if physicalism does not require chemical bonding to supervene on physics, why should it require the mental to supervene on the physical sciences? Okay, the realization that the mental does not supervene on the physical sciences, okay, if we, okay, if we were to come to that realization, it might take physicalists aback. However, if the world were not generally ordered by supervenience relations, if, for example, neither chemistry, nor botany, nor bacteriology, nor mycology had a supervenience base, physicalists I should, I think, take this in stride. That's just the way the physical world is, they should say. As I see it, physicalism could still hold, okay, why, why do I say that? Well, here's a little bit of my reason, and I think it's not fully figured out, but um, physicalism could still hold in such a disorderly world because 
while assuming that God does not really exist, the core physicalist commitment is a rejection of the idea that mentality requires some sort of special consideration, as it were, in the creation of the universe. Um, it's unclear just what precise conditions must be met in order to show that the mental is not given this sort of special consideration. Um, and let's see. But okay, so let's um, so it's not clear what it what I think I don't it doesn't make sense what I say right there next, but um, so it's not clear what that would take, but it seems that if the world were not at all ordered by supervenience relations, then the um, then the mental doesn't have some sort of special standing. And I think that sort of special standing, uh, yeah, there's more to say about this, but just that's sort of a brief way of putting it, this sort of special standing, is what really bothers the physicalist. Yet, um, the denial of soup, if, every, if there's radical um, non um, there that's, that doesn't show, that, that, should, that places the mental in the same place, along the same lines as everything else. And that, to me, seems like that's what really would satisfy physicalists. Okay. Um, okay, maybe I go on and say some of this now. Okay, so if the universe is generally unordered by supervenience relations, the mere failure of mental physical supervenience does not exalt mentality. What really matters to the physicalist is that the mental fits into our world more or less like any other higher level feature of the world. And I think that this is what really physicalists care about, even though they've gotten caught up in thinking that they care about supervenience. But um, the quarks and leptons only possibility, and the physical or the physical sciences only possibility, should be perfectly physically acceptable. Yet, if such possibilities are acceptable, even a weak form, if they're acceptable to the physicalist, even a weak form of supervenience such as RS is not actually a necessary condition for physicalism. Um, and now, of course, I think this is. May sound wrong. It seems to everyone I say it to. They really, if you're involved in the debate, if you're involved in the debate over physicalism, it really sounds wrong. If you're not, I think you'll see that what I'm saying is quite reasonable. But if you're involved, <laughs> if you're, because you you know, you're not blinded by this on this. Um, so, but it's just um, is found already that people just do not like this. Um, so. Okay, we've because we've just been reading. This is just you just see physicalism defined as in terms of some supervenience um, thesis. But there's an important question that just has not been addressed in this tradition, and this: Why should the existence of a supervenience relation be important to physicalists? Um, to respond, that's just what we mean. Of course, that's one response. That's just what we mean by physicalism. Would be reasonable if supervenience were. Um, included merely as a part of a stipulative definition of physicalism. So, of course, you can define physicalism in that, in that way. Go on from there. It's a perfectly interesting project. It's been done a lot already. Um, so it's perfectly interesting. But um, I think there's, I think it's not just a purely technical term we're using. There's something everyone in the debate feels that's at stake. Okay. Okay. So I think typically this is not this just stipulative definition is not the game being played. Rather, when philosophers implicitly or explicitly understand physicalism as entailing supervenience, they aim to capture what those involved in the debate think is really at stake. That is to capture what Chalmers calls the spirit of physicalism. Um, and I have been arguing that when we understand physicalism as entailing supervenience, we do not capture this. For the relevant physicalist commitment is not to the supervenience of the mental and the physical, but to the idea that mentality fits into the world more or less the way such things as chemical bonding, photosynthesis, and biological fitness fit into the world. One way this could happen would be if all higher level features of the world were to supervene on properties, entities, and laws of physics. That's one way. But another way would be if supervenience failed altogether. If so, physicalism does not entail supervenience of the mental on the physical. Um, let's 
Those who see physicalism as committed to the view that physics is the ontological basis of the world may hold that a supervenience relation matters to physicalists because it expresses this commitment. However, a supervenience relation such as RS is not the only way. Okay, so there is this sort of idea that some physicalists hold that, well, really physicalist is about showing how physics is the most basic science. Well, there are other ways to do that even while denying supervenience. For example, um, physics could still be considered more fundamental than other sciences in the world without supervenience, since even if higher level features of the world fail to supervene on physics, physics as opposed to, say, genetics investigates, you could say the way it does, and it investigates certain aspects of everything. Orcs and leptons comprise genes, but not vice versa. Um, so moreover, while rejecting RS, one could uphold a non-modal supervenience, such as Quine's claim that nothing happens in the world, not the flutter of an eyelid, not the flicker of a thought, without some redistribution of microphysical states. OK, he states it very nicely. Um, so non, you could uphold a non-modal version of supervenience. Isn't it? Yeah, nice to be able to write like that. This extremely <laughs> weak supervenience thesis is almost certainly true, if only for the reason that microphysical states are in constant flux. Okay, so it's, it's true. Uh, so we can take it as a necessary condition if we want to. However, contrary to Quine's view that physicalism and okay entails special deference to physical theory. Perhaps one can be an impertinent physicalist, even. So perhaps one doesn't even need to accept Quine's non mo I'm not going to argue for this, but eh, maybe even you don't even need to have deference to, physical, to, to, the, to physics. Perhaps physicalism, um, you know, the history of the term physicalism, I mean, it's changed it's quite how we use it quite a bit. And maybe even a commitment to physics isn't even necessary. This is not really a central part of my argument. But perhaps physicalism could still be true if the, um, and now you'll see it's not put as nicely as, as Quine, but I try here. If the flutter of an eyelid, the flicker of a thought, as well as the division of cells, the diffusion of dust, and more were to incur unfathomably, unfathomably during states of microphysical tranquility. Perhaps it could even be true if each one of the so-called levels or layers of the world, the microphysical level, the chemical level, the biological level, and so forth, were not hierarchically ordered, but instead somehow flourished independently of all others. Perhaps it could still be true. These speculations go beyond the claim I have aimed to establish, which is that physicalism does not entail a modal supervenience principle along the lines of RS. Um, I should mention, uh, well, I think I just won't mention it, actually. Um, and uh, for those of you who are familiar with my other work, like, not everyone seems to think this. This must be, because they're so shocked to hear that I'm denying that physicalism implies the convenience of the mental and the physical. You must just be meaning that other concept of physical that you reject. And the concept of physical that you accept, you're still accepting that, right? No, actually. Um, it's it, it, the paper actually has nothing to do with that. I mean, of course, it's real. everything's related in some way. It's um, just, it, it's not about that debate. So any supervenience base you want to take, my argument applies to it. So let's just to, you know, say that it's not about that. Um, if the failure of mind-body supervenience does not show that physicalism is false, what, okay, well, what else then might show this? Well, um, so physicalism fails if everything, um, perhaps, okay, perhaps here's one way to think about it. And this is where I see people sort of like being a little bit more sympathetic, maybe. Okay, well, here's maybe something that would show that physicalism is false. If everything except the mental were to supervene on the narrowly physical, um, so then physicalism would be false, because then the mental would be unique in some way. This would matter because of that core physicalist commitment to the idea that the mental does not require a special place in the order of the universe. And this in turn matters as I see it because a worldview that it exalts the mental suggests that human beings are exalted as well, which itself is a view that hits at, though does not imply, the clearly anti-physicalist anti conception of the world being created by God with us in mind. Um, if this is right, then we have a correct necessary condition. Of course, there are many necessary conditions for physicalism, but 
they are not really so useful, they're trivial, but here's a correct and maybe useful necessary condition for physicalism. Mental properties are not uniquely non-supervenient on narrowly physical properties. Um, so it seems to me that then that the mere failure of mind-body supervenience does not refute physicalism, but its unique failure does. Um, and this un and implicit in certain arguments against physicalism is the contention that the, this is the essential question. Actually, in these anti-physicalist arguments, um, you often see that an argument that um, the mental doesn't supervene on the narrowly physical, and then also some sort of claim, David Chalmers is very explicit about this, and yet it seems that everything else does. So this little extra part that everything else does would be superfluous if the mere supervenience of the mental on the physical were a necessary condition for physicalism. Um, but it's not superfluous as I see it. Rather, it is essential precisely because, in itself, the failure of the mental to supervene on the physical, despite what many explicitly say, does not really matter to physicalists. If so, physicalism does not imply even a weak mind-body supervenience um, principle of the sort formulated by Jackson, Lewis, and Chalmers. Okay, let's see, I have, I have a couple more things to say about the relevance, or should I, what should, um, Oh, two more slides, I guess, about the relevance. Or what, when do you usually end? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so well, what is the relevance? You know, what it would be the relevance? Because it should have some relevance to the mind-body problem. How would abandoning the view that physicalism implies mind-body supervenience affect the debate over the mind-body problem? Since the standard anti-physicalist arguments aim to disprove physicalism by refuting mind-body supervenience, they would not attain this end. Zombies, those microphysical duplicates of us that lack consciousness, could be consistently accepted as possible even by those who uphold physicalism. This, of course, does not show that physicalism is correct, but just that the anti-physicalist arguments as presented like that fail. Um, to improve them, Anti-physicalists would need to show not only that the mental does not supervene on the fundamental physical, but also that everything else does. As for those who aim to defend physicalism, they could, if they so desire, continue their crusades against zombies. However, on my view, another option emerges. They can turn to question whether supervenience on the fundamental physical is ubiquitous in the non-mental realm. For if it is not, the possibility of zombies might be irrelevant. Um, is it reasonable to question this? Well, although some philosophers of science, it seems to me, maybe some, do question whether we can reductively explain chemistry and other higher level sciences in terms of physics. They're hesitant to claim that these higher level sciences do not supervene on physics because, after all, the philosophers of minds say that this would mean that physicalism is false. But, as I have argued, there seems to be no reason to think that physicalism entails even the sort of weak supervenience principle proposed by Jackson. And once we relinquish this, it just might happen that the clues which have led some philosophers to question the reducibility of higher level sciences to physics will lead these same philosophers to question the supervenience of higher level sciences on physics. Um, how would the debate over the mind-body problem be affected if it were generally accepted that the hierarchy of sciences is not organized in terms of supervenience? Assuming that mentality does not reside at the level of fundamental physics, one possibility is that this would put an end to the debate over physicalism. Minds would fit into the physical world just as chemical bonds do, and thus would seem to be perfectly physically acceptable. Another possibility, however, is that a new necessary condition for physicalism would re arise in the debate over the mind-body problem would revolve around whether mental properties satisfy this necessary condition. Yet, what this necessary condition could be is a wide open question. Thank you.